Coming up on Theater Talk. How many times do we hear, well, the show's good, but except for that second act. Why is there always a problem in the second act, Tom? Yeah, there's, there's some stories that are hard to wind up, as mm -hmm. it were. You know, you, you set it up, but it, to, to get the proper finish is, is, I just know that my answer is always, bring them all out, the entire cast, and sing something. <laughs> <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation and Paul Bungert and Alan Lane. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskett. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Uh, Susan, there is a new um, collection of the great books to Broadway musicals. Yes, it's a by, box set. Put out by the Library of America. Uh, it is edited by our friend uh, Lawrence Larry Maslin, who joins us tonight on Theater Talk to talk about the great books to the Broadway musicals. Welcome. And lyrics. And we brought a couple of uh, experts on the subject uh, to <laughs> join, Larry. Uh, experts on the subject of writing books to musicals. We are joined by my good friend Richard Maltby, Jr., who wrote uh, Miss Saigon, Closer Than Ever, one of my favorites, Thank Big, you. and Baby. That's a, true. Right? A neglected classic, Baby, I must say. Yes. <laughs> you Let us not <laughs> leave it neglected longer. <laughs> right. and, and lyrics to so many more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And our other good friend, Tom Meehan, who wrote the books to Annie and the producers and Hairspray, and Ain't Broadway Grand, which I also think is a neglected <laughs> classic, Tom. Well, we're bringing it back next season. <laughs> I can't wait. All right, Larry, since With the... Bradley Cooper. <laughs> You'll do very well, I think. Um, now, Larry, do I take your point here that since you've collected the books to musicals, the scripts to the musicals, under the umbrella of the American, the Library of America, are you making the case that... These scripts, these books to our great Broadway musicals are part of the great American literature? Well, they made the case. I didn't. Um, these are shows from Showboat up to 1776, mm -hmm. and they are part of American culture. Everybody knows uh, Just Keep Rolling Along or Sing Out Louise or whatever. These are shows that are totally woven into the warp and woof of American life. And it's a project I worked on for eight years. And uh, Library of America, to their credit, and they also publish, you know, those, you know, little leaguers like Hawthorne and Poe and James Baldwin <laughs> and Tennessee Williams, said very quickly, yes, of course, these are major, major works. And as these two gentlemen know, and, and as you know, it's an awful lot of hard work. The craft of writing the book and lyrics to a musical is one of the most challenging things there is. So it was really great for me to reward the men and one woman. Betty Comden, right. uh, in these 16 shows, and say, yes, please take your place in the Pantheon, because you deserve to be there. And Bella Spiewak, right? And Bella Spiewak, yes, Definitely thank you. Bella Spiewak. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, Richard, when you look at the, the titles here, Guys and Dolls, The Pajama Game, My Fair Lady, Gypsy, Fiddler, Cabaret, 1776, um, among some of those titles, which one jumps out you as a book that you've always admired and wanted? They all are. Yeah. They all are, I, every one of them. It is, uh, the, I mean, you're quite right. These are the the icons of musical theater. And, and as time has gone on, they have become more and more important. They are they are like Peter Pan. They're like they're part of our mythology. They we know the lines, we know the dialogue, I mean, we know the, the lyrics, we know the moments from them. And what's really interesting about the struct about this this collection is that you can really see the structure and you can really see what makes them so significant. Right. They all share one really, really stunning quality, and that is they're brilliantly structured. And, you know, you go to the theater a lot these days, and you wish, you're sitting there wishing the structure of, the sh of a show you're watching was Wishing that better. Wishing that continue. Yeah, wish, wishing that, that, that uh, you know, that, that craft was still functioning. It is from time to time, but that's what you, you know. I, I want to get into uh, the sort of the nitty-gritty of the mechanics and the structure of some of these shows, Tom. Um, is there one here in particular that you've admired? And can you kind of explain to us as a, as a book writer yourself how the, how the book works and why it works so well? Well, I think Gypsy is, yeah. is, is, is the great book. That's of, the great of, book. Of all of them, uh, because uh, the, he did, uh, Arthur Lawrence did exactly the right thing, is that they discovered, you know, they had the, the rights to this kind of book about Gypsy Rose Lee's life, and you know, it was kind of a standard throwaway book. Who, yeah. who, but they 
zeroed in on the mother. That's where it was. And, and they made it, it, it became a musical about this mad woman. It's, and you have Merman and you put that together. It's like, it, it's just a killer of a musical. And it's so beautifully constructed. But right from the first moment with seeing Aunt Louise, she's there. Right. And you have a major character with a big problem who you follow through for the whole show. Bigger than life character. I always think that's what makes mu big musicals work. One of the things I notice in, in, in these shows is that they, most of them have a central character who's just a dynamic right. driving force. And right. I see a, a lot of musicals today where the lead characters tend to be passive and you feel the show sort of collapsing yeah. around. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a sense that that's one of the things that makes these books work? Um, I, I think that changed a little bit over time. I think as you look in the shows in the 50s, we, we, you look in the 40s and you have that Rodgers and Hammerstein, romantic leads, comic second leads, older figure. That template was pretty strong and stayed around through Guys and Dolls. But then it's interesting, as you say, when you get to My Fair Lady, Gypsy with Rose, Pseudalus and Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, Tevia Fiddler on the Roof, and I guess the MC slash uh, uh, Sally Bowles in Cabaret, but John Adams in 1776. Yeah. I mean, that character is on stage the entire show, and he really drives it from beginning to end. In, in terms of structure, I'm a big fan of 1776. Yeah. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. And thing. supposedly, Peter when Peter Stone sold it to the movies in, you know, what, nine months after it, it opened in 1969, he ran into Sondheim on the street, and he said, Steve, great news, we've sold the film rights to 1776. And Sondheim said, great, now you can fix the second act. <laughs> um, so there's and, no America. <laughs> well, but if there was ever a show that working backwards had that a great second act, well, it was always done in one, one act, actually, yeah. but yeah. had a great finale, it was 1776. Yeah. So that's one show that never had a second act problem because you knew where you were going to Well, go one of the things that. I admired about that book, and I think Peter Stone, who wrote it, also achieved it a little bit in Titanic, too, was you know the ending, yeah. Yeah, but that's somehow right. he has you on the edge of your seat because you're not quite sure if they're going to sign the Declaration of Independence. It's totally true. Well, it, right up to the last minute, you can see that, that the vote is going against them. Yeah, that's <laughs> until, right. that, until the slavery vote... And it's one brilliant moment in the show when they when the when the vote comes and they put all of, and they put all those South votes over here. Then finally, it all comes down to the the nerd from Philadelphia from uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> right. There are three votes. There's there's uh, uh, the the conservative. There's Ben Franklin and the one person who doesn't matter at all, <laughs> and the whole thing hinges on him. Right. And he votes for the declaration so that he won't be the person who voted against it. Mm. Right. And it goes over to the other side and there's silence on the stage yeah. because they can't believe it actually happened. Yeah. It's a stunningly structured book. Yeah. The really. only thing about that show is some do argue that it's a play with music. I mean, Peter, we had Peter Stone on this show, and he yeah. said he loved it so much because, what did he say, there's 38 minutes before there's a song. Yeah. <laughs> he, he loved that. My friend Peter Hunt directed it, and, and, and it was his first show, and he called me up and said, um, how long can a book scene be in a musical? And I said, well, I don't know, maybe three pages, and you better have a song. And he said, I said, how long is yours? He said, it's 14 pages. <laughs> Well, Peter was Peter was never one for concision. Always, he did. Like, oh, right. But yeah. one thing, I but think, it is a structurally brilliant. Oh, yeah. scene. It's a great, great and, job. And one thing I think that that you also look at these shows that people said, you know what, let's do Oklahoma, and you know what, there won't be a specialty dance for the comic, and there won't be a, uh, you know, we won't stop the show dead. That was actually rather revolutionary in the shows like 1776 or Gypsy that had an unattractive lead, leading character, yeah. or My Fair Lady, God knows, right. were the shows that broke out of the mold, and oddly enough, those are the ones that really stood the test of time and became eternal shows well, and will always be revived. I mean, My Fair Lady, as I read in your book, was, was so closely modeled on Pygmalion, there were really very few changes. But mm -hmm. I always loved Gypsy the most, too, because I think of it as having no fat and you go, you yeah. know that there is there is nothing in there that isn't that needed to drive the plot. And when you get to Act Two, there's what four songs? Yeah, it's just wonderful because he doesn't, Lawrence doesn't waste your time. You just get it so precisely done. It's beautiful. And, and then he gives you the big, big, big finish, which is yes. just wonderful. Yes. I mean, it's so great. Rose's turn is like, 
the greatest showstopper of all time. Right, right. But then you think the Robert Rogers and Hammerstein show that was not so successful, like Flower Drum Song, where they still felt compelled to put in a dream ballet in Act yeah. Two, and it seemed in the modern era so unnecessary. And you had a dream ballet in the producers, didn't you, Tom? But you had yeah. to cut it. Not a <laughs> <laughs> Now we're putting it back in when the revival. Right. Well, yeah. apparently there was one in Fiddler on the Roof. There was a dream. Well, not the wonderful dream sequence was there, but there was some kind of tortured dream sequence that they, they Well, got. there's the, the Havala Ballet, which, oddly enough, is one of the most beautiful pieces of music that Jerry Bach ever wrote. Really? Yeah. And it didn't make it to the cast album. Yeah. But I guess it was condensed, really, because that's another thing I think deserves to be mentioned is George Abbott, Jerry Robbins, Hal Prince oh. are also very much part of the writing and crafting of what made, I think each of them worked on four of the shows in the, in the anthology, yeah. and they deserve to be acknowledged as well for, for their incredible work in shaping these shows. When you say, mention the cast albums, what I like about this book is that at last you can actually read the text of, of these uh, big shows. They're very hard to find otherwise. This, yeah, absolutely. This is a real gift. Yeah. Do you guys feel neglected when, uh, the, well, you do lyrics, too, so you're on the cast album, but the cast album comes out and <laughs> no. says, you know, book by Tom Meehan, but there might be a little snatch yeah. of the dialogue well, here, here right. and there. Do you, do you well, right. if, if, the, if the book not. to Miss Saigon is like the show, well, and, right. and they record the whole show, so but, <laughs> I don't have a complaint there. Well, I, like an Annie, I just have, uh, if not today, Sandy, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, you, that's, <laughs> that's what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. what, at what stage of the game did you write that? <laughs> oh, wrote, they wrote that. That's the second song they wrote. Oh, right. So, I, now, Richard, I, <laughs> but you plugged in your lyrics. I plugged in that great <laughs> lyric that right. made it happen. R Richard, in some ways, you pioneered this sort of you, you and um, um, David Shire. The, I mean, it's I, I don't want to call it a bookless form, but a review like Closer Than Ever or Starting yeah. Here, Starting Now. Which is very tightly structured, though, is it not? It, it, it is. I call, and so is Amos Behaven, and so is yeah. Fosse. I always, I call them bookless book musicals. That, that is to say, there, there is in, an internal structure which is close to the structure of a, uh, of a book musical, uh, unknown to anyone. It starts you in a place, it leads you to the next place, and uh, it's never spelled out. I trust the audience gets it. They seem to, um, but I wouldn't know. Uh, because it's never, it's, it's never... Uh, it's well, never I thought it works remarkably well in Ain't Misbehaving because through the course of that evening, mm -hmm. you come to know each of these characters mm -hmm. individually. And they have scenes together and they have a kind of backstory, if you will, of their lives, mm -hmm. even without them ever coming out to say it. Yeah, I, I've, I've actually always thought, wouldn't it be interesting to take those backstories and make them a front story, make a movie out of, out of Ain't Misbehaving by using the backstories? Mm -hmm. They're very elaborate. Larry, give us the importance, though, of um, I think the first book you uh, book musical you use here is Showboat. What what is what is revolutionary about Showboat? Well, you know, Showboat is the granddaddy of them all, and it it was the it's when you look at that show in context, it was the first show adapted from a serious novel to the Broadway musical. Mm -hmm. It was the first show that it was extended over decades, and Hammerstein's ability to compress Edna Ferber's novel is extraordinary. And it also had the first time where black characters and white characters, as characters, not as in a review, say, shared the stage with kind of equal integrity. So everything just sort of moves forward. I think Oscar, God bless him, the, the dean of all book musicals, uh, foundered on the shoals to, to beat a metaphor to death in Showboat uh, in the second act. And if you look at some of the notes in the back of this edition, he tried and tr it was a little unwieldy and I th think still is in performance. Uh, they always wanted Paul Robeson to play Joe, and at one point, if you look at one of the early drafts in the second act, Joe is uh, and and Queenie are, are, are sit no uh, Captain Andy and, and and Queenie I think are sitting on the on the boat. It's 1927. So whatever happened to Joe? Oh well, you know he had a grandson, and that grandson grew up to be Paul Robeson. Oh really? <laughs> and here he is now singing on the concert stage, and Paul Robeson was supposed to come out and sing, you know, g some spiritual or something in the middle of Showboat in the second act. And Oscar <laughs> wisely said, maybe not the best idea. <laughs> but that to say, he didn't really come up with a, that much of a better idea, but we owe so much to Showboat in terms of its dramatic integrity and what it tried to do. It said musicals didn't have to be kind of silly and frivolous and... And sketches, and, really, collection and of sketches. sketches. But I have to say, the next show in the anthology has gotten a lot of um, 
people are sort of divided, which is as thousands cheer, yeah. which was the 1933 review written by Irving Berlin and Moss Hart. So you chose that one to include as a... Well, I think the review form is so important to the history of the musical, and it gets neglected yeah. because reviews are topical. That's what makes them great. It right. also is what makes them vulnerable historically. I think that book is historic because yeah. uh, I've, never, I've never read as thousands of cheer. I've never even seen, uh, been able to read it. And the, and it's startling because the sketches are really They're good. good. They are fun. They're really good, Not and they hard. they would play right now. I mean, Re Rockefeller's birthday party where he his children give him Rockefeller Center. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really it's nice. And he's so tight. Yeah, I mean, really, that's I mean that's that's as good as it can and get. And you're a big as thousands cheer fan uh, uh, too. Now, yeah. Well, I had again, uh, like Richard, I hadn't seen it, read it, say, well, I've seen every one of these musicals several times, I believe. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that one I didn't know at all, and I just, I was laughing away. Moss Hart's, you know, he's a funny, funny guy. That, it was really brilliant stuff. Yeah, very And then well. you have Ethel Ward is singing Supper Time in the <laughs> middle of all that. Wow. <laughs> well, it was well, a really evening. topical. Yeah. I mean, they took yeah. on the, the not only the, the, the funny political themes, but the serious ones yeah. as well. Yeah. And um, and sometimes they had had fun with them, and sometimes they just went there. And uh, the idea of headlines being the the, uh, the the linking device that 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 held the show together, it's uh, which itself is it's, a kind of a vaudevillian thing where they used to just mm -hmm. hold up the yeah. you know the, the titles of the next scene or the next sketch coming. It was a, it was a different way of doing that, and uh, that made it topical. And because uh, the other thing about about. Uh, Showboat is that it's it's about miscegenation. Mm -hmm. It's it's yeah. it's about a really really uh, you know toxic. And then subject. you come back with, I mean this this book has three Oscar Hammerstein librettos, and you come back with South Pacific, which yeah. is also about the, uh, the racism. And um, oh, what's the third Hammerstein you have in there? Uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma of course. So, but, but we found a line in Oklahoma which has never been allowed to be performed, I guess, for decades, which when Will Parker comes back and does everything is up to date in Kansas City, so he said, Will, that's a great, great dance move, you know. He said, yeah, a couple of colored guys taught it to me in Kansas City. Oh. <laughs> and so Hammerstein's preoccupation with race even goes through the most seemingly benign shows, and in the first volume, which has eight titles, I think with the exception of one of them, all of them had integrated casts when they opened. <laughs> Finian's Rainbow, on the town, South Pacific, obviously showboat. So they were thinking about race and politics in an era that we don't necessarily think we thought, maybe we thought was sort of frivolous, and it certainly wasn't. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, um, uh, Tom and Richard, uh, Larry said, you know, there's a problem still in the second act of showboat. How many times do we hear, well, the show's good, but except for that second act, why is there always a problem in the second act, Tom? Uh, I don't know. You, you, have, you go into something and you you plunge into it and work so hard, and you say, we'll get to the second act later, because we're, <laughs> we're working on the first act, and we got the first act. And then you suddenly see this looming up, and there's some stories that are hard to wind up, as it were, you know, you, you set it up, but it, to, to get the proper finish is, is, I just know that my answer is always, bring them all out, the entire cast, and sing something. <laughs> <laughs> Like, you can't stop the beat in the hairspray. It takes care of the problem. Take care of the problem. In the producers, was there a place in the second act where you, you, had, you had a problem that you resolved? Yeah, we had a lot of problems with right after we did uh, Springtime for Hitler because it was such a big deal. And then the scene following it uh, was our biggest tough scene to solve because we, it sort of, when we, we did the show in Chicago, that scene was like suddenly the black hole of Calcutta. We couldn't, and we kept reworking it. Re How'd you finally fix it then? We shortened it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't cut it entirely. We, but, you know, that was one of my ideas. You know, let's cut this whole scene. Let's <laughs> move just on. Important. But we, we did a, a kind of quick, uh, short, uh, much shorter version of it. We, we had five or six good gags. We kept those and rushed Move right along. Move right along, folks. I think the, the question is, is which are the second acts that work? You have to ask the, you know, about yes. the ones that work, yeah. and then you can pretty much answer about the ones. The ones that work are the ones that continue the, the trajectory straight through. Yeah. Whatever they sent up, they follow straight. The second act of My Fair Lady, yeah. right, right, right through to the end. Yep. Second act of South Pacific, second act of King and I. They're just absolutely perfectly structured. And as a sense of action, they drive, they, they follow the opening action consistently 
step by step through yeah. to the end, and that's part of the reason why it's satisfying. As we're taping this, we're coming off from last night they aired the Peter Pan on NBC Live. And the thing that, beyond any other quibbles one might have with it, the thing that was interesting to it was it went on and on because it, they, they wrote new songs, they restored a song that had been cut, which you saw why it had been cut. And yes, they had to fill three hours, but you thought, why are you padding this? I guess, I guess it was to sell more commercials on television. But, mm -hmm. but again, the, the impetus was not to go to get to the no, point. No, you want that yeah. narrative. Yeah. Yeah. Second act, the, Peter Pan has a first act, it has a... God only knows what in the second act, and it has a lovely ending. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. basically, all they did in, in when all Robbins did was keep tossing in animals who danced and <laughs> trees that moved. And I mean, they didn't know what to do with the second act. They just sort of. But I, I want to take your point, Susan. Is Billy Wilder once said, "It's easy to have a good second act. All you need is a good first act." <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, he wisely sold all his movies to Broadway and, and never, I don't think he even saw Promises, Promises, who knows. But I think that's a really good point is I, I think the good ones, especially, and, and I obviously include Annie in that, start with such a strong premise early on that you kind of have to, as long as the show sort of gets out of the way of the premise and doesn't put the sort of excrescence of junk, the good ones tend to work really well right out of the canon, it seems to me. One of the things I wanted to um, just touch on Annie, we think Annie is a kid's show, yeah. but in fact, I think Annie's a much more sophisticated show, a show that makes political points. And when you guys were writing it, you didn't set out to be doing a family entertainment, did we, you? We, we didn't. Uh, we wrote this in the era of uh, Richard Nixon in the White House originally, and we were thinking, we were all New Yorkers, and we were thinking about, had grown up in the Depression, and we were thinking, what. What was America like when they had a good president in the United States, so Richard Nixon? And uh, we, we decided to write something political based it on this comic strip. And Annie is, in fact, as the musical progresses, in Act Two, she becomes a metaphor. She stops being a real child and she steps up in the Oval Office on the desk and sings tomorrow and creates the New Deal. <laughs> I mean, Why not? Artistic. Absolutely brilliant idea. <laughs> <laughs> just brilliant. In the new Jamie Foxx, Annie, which is yeah, yeah, both have opened. Any of your lines left? <laughs> I mean, yeah. no, none of my lines. None of your lines left? No, very, right. very few. Very but, few. As, but, but, but the structure's the same, by the way. So, so do you get credited for, as, as the book writer? Are you then credited? No, I, no I'm just... You are on the movie poster. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. No, oh, I, you are, so you do. You, but I didn't, way, I didn't write... kiosks for you. I didn't write the script. Tom said that his, some of his words are no longer in the screenplay. Does it happen when you're writing a book and you come up with a great scene? Does the, the, the composer and the lyricist sometimes steal it from you and it becomes a song and you, you lose it? Speaking as the lyricist, <laughs> in a heartbeat. Yeah. <laughs> That's, and I know. We live for it. We just, <laughs> and, and, and actually, I, I, the, the, the painful lesson that any book writer of a musical comes to is, that's my job. My well, job is to write something wonderful that they can take and make into a song. Well, I say it's not called a musical for nothing. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's right. about the music, it's about the score. And, and so you write a scene and they say, oh, we got an idea for a song, we'll do that. Right. But the only thing, once in a great while, I get back a song that has nothing to do with the scene. They sort of suddenly get lost their way, they wrote another song. Oh. And so then I have to go back to the drawing board and figure out how I can make this song fit into this show. Or can't you just tell them they're, they're wrong and well, they need to come with well, a new song to you? Once in a while I do that. But <laughs> Better, <laughs> don't worry, Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, but you know, right. uh, Larry, before we, before we wrap it up, uh, these are uh, the classic American musicals. Yeah. Can you, if you were to do a third volume, oh. uh, which, which I you, hope you will do, yeah. what, what sh more contemporary shows have you admired of recent years that you think uh, should be included with the with Well, the Annie, Miss Saigon. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. Um, <laughs> a uh, good start. But beyond that, I don't know. You know, it's interesting. Fun, huh? Things changed so much in 1970 uh, with company. Yeah. yeah. And, and everything gets yeah. kind of fractured, and, and, and Annie is, and is such an interesting model from the, from the constructed era of musicals. So I guess my, I would kind of step back and say that the sort of sands of time have to form a more formidable bulwark before I would commit, but I would love to see an edition of the six Sondheim Prince musicals. Well, I was thinking, because I think yeah. that if you read them, as I hope people will read these 16 shows kind of in a row, because they're not just meant to be cherry-picked. If right, you, you look at the, the arc of them, yeah. they're really interesting. And certainly those six shows were so interesting and merrily went through different iteration so you could have two versions of that in the book and then 
after that, I, I guess I leave it to someone else. I think a show like A Chorus Line, as astonishing and influential as it was, is a show to be seen and heard, not so much a show to be, be read. read. Yeah. Um, and I think that does change after night. I mean, I would put in a, a nod to Hugh Wheeler because I think the book oh, to yeah. Sweeney Absolutely. Todd and Little, Little Night, Night Music, Music. Oh, very, very, very good yeah. books. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to add that in addition to the scripts that are so wonderful, you have wonderful production notes where you've taken uh, writings by the librettists and a lot of information. So it's, it's really full of gems. And there's some alternate lyrics, yes. lyrics that were added in later productions and notes that Arthur Lawrence wrote to incorporate right. in subsequent productions. It's really, it's really fun. So here it is. And it's putting volumes. the book, the book writer back to his proper place, or right. his or her proper well, place, in the American theater. It, it is in, true. In the back. Actually, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and they call them wordsicles from now on. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> right, okay. Yeah, right, right. Um, uh, the books are uh, American musicals, edited by Lawrence Maslin, out from the Library of America. Thank you for being our guest. Thank you for having me. Tommy, it's always a pleasure to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you. you. And Richard, it's good to see you, too. Thank you. Thanks a lot, good guys. Good to see you. <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, plus public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>